Welcome back to the lab. Today I'm going to present a process to make two-layer printed circuit boards at home, including copper-plated vias. Making homemade two-layer PCBs without plated vias has been done by countless experimenters. Rivets are sometimes used to connect the top and bottom traces. Some experimenters tried coating holes in conductive graphite and electroplating copper, and a few ones succeeded in electroless plating, for example the DIY Homemade and GUSER 210 on YouTube. But all the plating experiments I have seen don't go as far as making a fully working PCB. For anyone who has tried, depositing copper inside the holes is only half of the battle, the other half is protecting it during the subsequent etching step. Thus, as far as I know, despite two-layer PCBs have been manufactured industrially for around 80 years, no one has yet presented a complete step-by-step -step procedure to replicate this manufacturing process in an amateur setting, or I couldn't find it. To fill this gap, I'm presenting Process 01, an open-source PCB production process. Process 01 is released under a Creative Commons license and is composed of a step-by-step -step process description, currently made of 31 steps, about a third being simple water rinses though, as well as a description of how to prepare all the chemical solutions required. I've been working on this process since around 2017, and in 2021 I finally succeeded in making my first two-layer PCBs. Currently I consider this process as usable as alpha software. While it does work, there is likely much room for simplification and improvement. To demonstrate process 01, I will be making the PCB for this board. It is an LED display board that I need for another project, requiring a two-layer PCB to route all tracks. Process 01 requires as input four masks, printed from a PCB card, two for the top and bottom copper and two for the solder mask, as well as information on where holes should be made in the PCB. Process 01 uses standard double-sided copper clad boards, not coated with any photoresist as the photoresist needs to be applied much later in the process. The first step is to drill the board. Double-sided tape is applied to the board to fix it to the bed of a CNC mill. The appropriate drill bit is used and the board is drilled. I'm using Flatcam and BCNC but any software would work. You can also drill the board by hand if you don't have a CNC mill, but you would need some sort of mask to be able to position the holes precisely. The next step is a light sandpaper step to remove burrs left by the drilling process. Of course, both sides need to be sandpapered. Wetting the sandpaper with water helps. I'm using 320 grit sandpaper, but it is not critical. Just don't use too coarse sandpaper and don't go as far as to remove the copper. The next step is a simple water rinse to remove dust particles. I'm using the ionized water as I'll be reusing this water for the next step. After the water rinse, the board needs to be chemically cleaned to remove even the slightest trace of oils that would ruin the adhesion of the plated copper. For this, I'm using a roughly 10% by weight solution of sulfuric acid that I'm making in place by adding 13 ml of concentrated sulfuric acid to the 225 ml of water of the previous rinse bath. The concentration of sulfuric acid is not critical. To also clean the drilled holes, try to avoid the formation of air bubbles inside the drill holes. The cleaning step requires heating at 65 degrees and stirring for around 10 minutes. This cleaning solution can be reused multiple times, so it's best to keep it. The next step is again a water rinse. Step 6 is the electroless activation of the PCB surface. It is done by dipping the PCB in an acidic palladium chloride solution. Since palladium is expensive, I'm using the smallest container I could find that can fit the PCB. This step requires the PCB to remain in the activation bath with occasional agitation for around 5 minutes at ambient temperature. The next step is the post-activation. The PCB is dipped in an acidic tin chloride solution with stirring for 5 minutes at ambient temperature. 
The purpose of this step is to reduce the palladium chloride to palladium metal, leaving an invisible coat of palladium atoms on the PCB. These palladium atoms will catalyze the decomposition of the next solution, the electroless plating one, plating copper onto the PCB. Again, we find a water rinse step to prevent cross-contamination of the solutions. The next step is the actual electroless plating. The PCB is dipped in the electroless copper plating bath, and this is where the magic happens. If the pH of the bath is sufficiently basic, and the PCB has been correctly activated, hydrogen will start bubbling from the PCB surface, possibly after an induction period of a couple of minutes. What you are seeing is formaldehyde in the solution reducing copper salts to copper metal. As anticipated, the reduction only occurs in the presence of palladium atoms. Thus, the entire solution does not decompose to copper metal, and the reduction only occurs at the PCB surface. Moreover, the process is also autocatalytic, meaning that once the palladium atoms have been occluded by the formed copper layer, the process does not stop, as the newly formed copper with hydrogen bonded to the surface catalyzes the decomposition just as well as the palladium, allowing the formation of a thick copper layer without stopping at just a few atoms thickness. Electroless plating needs to be continued with stirring at ambient temperature until the sides of the PCB appear fully plated. Time is between, between 20 to 40 minutes. Please note that formaldehyde is carcinogenic, so this step must be performed inside a fume hood. After electroless plating, the PCB requires another water rinse. The color of the formed copper layer is usually a bit dull. Electroless plating allowed us to deposit copper also on the non-conductive surface of the whole walls, and that's its strength. However, its weakness is that it's rather slow, so once a thick enough layer has been deposited to carry an electrical current, we can boost the copper thickness with electroplating. The electroplating bath is an acidic solution of copper sulfate. For electroplating, we need to attach copper electrodes to the side of the wicker, connected to po the positive of a constant current power supply. The negative will be connected to the PCB we are plating. The plating solution is heated at 60 degrees and stirred, and plating is continued at a current of 25 mA per square centimeter for 20 minutes. During the plating, some copper sludge detached from the electrodes and began floating around in the beaker, some unfortunately deposited on the PCB and was plated over, essentially gluing it to the PCB. An improvement of this step would be to enclose the anodes in a bag of porous material to contain the sludge. When the PCB is removed from the beaker, it should have the characteristic salmon orange color of freshly electroplated copper. The next step is, as usual, another water rinse. Step 13 is a lights and paper step, used to remove the copper sludge particles that have been deposited on the PCB during the electrolytic plating. This step can be omitted if sludge containment is used and the resulting surface finish is proven to be good enough for a photoresist adhesion. Another water rinse is then performed, immediately followed by an acetone rinse. As anticipated, plating the copper on the whole walls is useless unless it can be protected from the etchant, and for this good photoresist adhesion is fundamental. The acetone rinse not only helps cleaning the PCB surface, but since it displaces water and evaporates much faster than water, allows a quick drying of the PCB, minimizing the formation of copper oxide on prolonged exposure to air. Step 16 is to let the PCB dry on a warm 60 degrees hot plate. It should take no more than a couple of minutes. The next step consists in applying the photoresist to both sides of the PCB. The photoresist used can be easily found on eBay, and it is a gelled negative photoresist, resembling sheets of double-sided tape, as the actual photoresist is sticky and sandwiched between two layers of thin protective plastic. As the photoresist is very sensitive to light, around 5 times more than the positive photoresist used in single size that the presensitized boards, it is best to avoid exposure to white light. My lab is equipped with a 1 watt yellow LED for this. The rolled up photoresist is cut to sides with a pair of scissors, 
One of the two protective plastic layers is peeled away with the help of some scotch tape and the photoresist is applied on the PCB. After the photoresist has been applied on both sides of the PCB, it needs to be hot rolled using a modified document laminator and then immersed in cold water to cool it immediately. We are now at the exposure step. The mask is placed on a glass plate inside up and a few drops of water help it stick to the glass just enough. The PCB is then placed on the mask and carefully aligned so that all holes line up with the mask. Of course, as the photoresist is negative, the mask is negative too and lets light through where we want copper. Exposure is done as usual with ultraviolet light. The argon cylinder is used as weight to make sure the mask and PCB adhere perfectly. With my UV setup, exposure lasts only 50 seconds, while ordinary po positive presensitized boards take 4 minutes. After the exposure, it is important to let the photoresist polymerize by placing it on a 60 degrees hot plate for 5 minutes, as negative photoresists work by hardening upon exposure to UV. After polymerization, we are ready to develop the photoresist. This is done with a solution of 3 grams of potassium carbonate in 100 milliliters of water. This step is quick enough that it can be performed with lights turned on. The last protective plastic foil is removed from both sides and the PCB is dipped in the developer. Note that as the photoresist is gelled, it does not wash away and gentle scrubbing with a sponge is needed to remove it. A water rinse follows to stop the action of the developer and then the PCB is dried on a hot plate and visually inspected. As can be seen from microscope pictures, the photoresist being gelled has the property of creating a protective barrier also on top of holes, thus preventing ingress of the agent, which would destroy the deposited copper. If the photoresist was not applied perfectly, it may form wrinkles during the hot lamination process, resulting in exposed copper. This can be fixed, to some extent, with a permanent ink marker. We are now at the etching step, which will reveal if our PCB will be a success or a failure. As usual, I'm using copper chloride, my agent of choice, as it can be regenerated. I keep it in an almost spent, highly concentrated form, so it immediately turns dark when the PCB is added. Just a few drops of hydrogen peroxide are enough to restore the green color and consequently its etching power. The PCB is visually inspected from time to time, and when the etching is complete, yet another water rinse follows. The photoresist needs to be stripped, and for this hot concentrated sodium hydroxide is used. Be very careful when mixing sodium hydroxide with water as the reaction is highly exothermic and the water nearly boils. No further heating is required. Sometimes the photoresist may be very stubborn to remove. In this case, prolonged soaking in sodium hydroxide solution and stirring is required. However, I found that in this case some copper oxidation occurs, but this does not impact the solderability later on. A water rinse follows again, and the PCB is then dried on a hot plate. Steps 27 to 30 are the same as 17 to 20, only the solder mask is applied instead of the photoresist. The solder mask material I use is a negative one, and it is very similar to the negative photoresist, only the color differs. I didn't film steps 27 to 29, but I have the video of step 30, allowing to see the removal of the gelled solder mask, revealing the copper pads. Step 31 is the final step and consists in UV curing the solder mask for 30 minutes per side to achieve perfect adhesion. This completes the steps of process 01. The PCB is now ready to solder and test. In the next video I will describe the preparation of the various reagents required by process 01.